God, from you come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. For those of you who are gathered, take a moment to welcome one another. And for those of you online, please share a word of peace in the comment or chat. Our first reading today is from Jeremiah chapter 29, starting with the 10th verse. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not, to, not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord." And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I, where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back to this place 
from which I sent you into exile. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you feel called for the reading of the gospel. <clears throat> Our gospel today comes from Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. People were bringing little children to Jesus in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant, and he said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, and he laid hands on them, and he blessed them. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. <clears throat> I love to tell the story. It will be my theme and glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. love. Arabella Hankey and William Fisher Hymn number 661 in the Red Book. When I agreed to be part of the sabbatical team, Rob and I did not plan for me to give this message immediately following his series on children leading. I even chose the readings for this week back in January. But when the Spirit is at work, amazing things happen. So welcome to the fourth installment of A Child Shall Lead Us, Personal Testimony Edition. This is my faith story. A much simpler subject than, say, the ascension of Jesus. Although this time there are no experts to draw from, there are no authors to provide insights. Now, I have no come to Jesus moment that brought me here. I have no interesting second chance stories, no aha moments where God gently leads me to where I was always meant to be. My life has been a continuous journey of faith, a generational faith passed down from mothers. To their children. My roots here are deep. They span now six generations. I was baptized, went to Sunday school, and confirmed at St. Luke's. I have taught Sunday school, confirmation, led adult Bible study. I have served on call committees and council, even serving as president. And I sing in several music groups, use my voice as a cantor, and lead worship as a worship assistant. But there's really nothing any interesting or very interesting or special or even unique about any of that. So where to begin? Sunday school lessons and Christmas programs? Childhood memories of going to camp or maybe those long bus rides on choir tour and mission trips. Perhaps all of those Monday nights gathered around a candle singing and praying with my peers in junior and senior high down in the fellowship hall. There are certainly a lot of experiences that, I, that have shaped my faith. But there is one common thread I kept coming back to while I was writing this. This place, St. Luke's. I realized my faith story is not linear. It is a continuing set of promises fulfilled. So maybe it's best to start at the beginning. My faith journey starts right here. In April of 1981. My young mother brought me to this font, and she made promises to me. For those who are visual learners, in the front of that red hymnal in front of you, in the small pages in the beginning, on page 227, you will find the order of baptism. We don't generally use it in the services because we read from it from a simplified version, but if you ever want to check back and see what those promises were, that's where you will find it. And on page 28, those promises are laid out that we make to each child brought to this font. As you bring your child to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with responsibilities to live among God's faithful people, to bring them to the word of God and the Holy Supper, to teach them the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, and place in their hands the Holy Scriptures, and nurture them in faith and prayer so that your child may learn to trust God and proclaim Christ through word and deed care for others and the world God made, and to work for justice and peace. Do you promise to help your child grow in Christian faith and life? 
These promises are an integral part to who I have become. And if we are grading my mom for keeping them, I think she deserves an A+. Promise number one, living among God's faithful people. My earliest memories of being at church involved gathering around tables laden with food. Whether it was a hurried Wednesday night, before choir, Wednesday night dinner before choir, or one of those famous St. Luke's potlucks down in the fellowship hall, or even just a cookie between services, there was always laughter and caring conversation. And those conversations built the foundation for my faith to grow, even as a small child. It was incredible feeling to know that so many people here knew who I was. And today, one of my favorite sounds on a Sunday morning is listening to the kids play in the playground. Let the little children lead them, and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Living among God's, God, living among God's faithful people from an early age created a safe place for me to learn and grow. I grew up knowing that this was my home and that I belonged here just as I was. And I love knowing our kids get to feel the same way. Promise number two, bring them to the word of God and the Holy Supper. Now, most Sunday mornings, I joined the other choir orphans, those of us whose parents were in the choir, <clears throat> and we would sit in the corner of the balcony or back on the stairs, which are actually behind this wall right here, and that's where we would play during the service. <clears throat> and all it took was a single look from any choir member, parent or not, to remind us that we were in worship and our praises were getting a little too loud. <laughs> but I was there. And it's true that kids absorb more than we think they do. While I may not have understood everything, I knew the flow of the service and could recite the right things at the right time. And it made me excited to be able to participate in service as I got older. And that's why I feel comfortable serving as a cantor or a worship assistant now. The traditions of worship were ingrained in me at an early age. And throughout my life, those traditions have brought me comfort Promise number three, teach them the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments. As a young participant in those worship services, memorizing the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed were pretty easy when we got to them in Sunday school and confirmation. After all, I had heard them over and over for years. And the Ten Commandments, well, they were a little harder. I mean, we covered them in Sunday school, and I knew the basics of what they were, and that counts mostly, right? Maybe we should come back to this one. Promise number four, placing in their hands the Holy Scriptures. I received my first Bible in preschool, my first real Bible, the ones with the chapters and the verses, in second grade, and then a more advanced Bible in confirmation. And as an adult, I have purchased several Bibles for study myself. On Thursday nights as a kid, I participated in God's Gifts, a program where we learned Bible stories and memorized scriptures. And I was the proud winner of the most Bible verses memorized in fifth grade. I even had a trophy. So that definitely counts. Although my mom couldn't always answer my sometimes numerous questions about what it all meant. She gave me the correct tools. She could teach me the words and she could show me where to find the passages, but she didn't always have the meanings behind the tenets of the Christian faith. So does that mean maybe she doesn't deserve an A plus? Does that mean she didn't really fulfill the promises? These promises must have been overwhelming to her. How was she supposed to teach me about God when she was still learning herself? Well, here's the secret. Even though she was young, she understood the power of the people of God. Skipping ahead in that baptism service just a little bit, we come to what I feel is the most important part, the part where you come in. People of God, do you promise to support this child and pray for them in their new life in Christ? See, my mom wasn't the only one who made those promises to me. As a congregation, we also make those promises to each member we baptize. St. Luke's is a keeper of those promises. And my young mother brought me to this font because she knew she would need a community to help raise her child. And she chose St. Luke's. She chose you. My greatest biblical teachers were not at Gustavus Adolphus College or even the Academy of Holy Angels. They were right here. 
and none of them were professionals, just people with a passion for learning and sharing. In Sunday school, I was taught for several years by Barb Roberts. She taught our preschool class that the Lord's Prayer was not just something we said at our church, but it was something that all Christians say, in every language even. And she was right. <laughs> Standing in a pew in saint Malo, France, at the age of 18, I may not have understood the words just before communion, but I knew exactly what was being said. I had faith in what she taught me. I have yet to meet a better teacher of the Ten Commandments than Marv Cook. He held a classroom of 12-year-olds in awe, explaining that these commandments not just connected all Christians, but all of God's children to our common roots. My definition of God's people got a lot bigger after those lessons, and it opened a path to conversations with people from all religious backgrounds that I have encountered throughout my life. And I will always cherish my debates with Warren Carpenter about the articles of the Apostles' Creed, Martin Luther's explanation of them, and I often think about the times I would sit with him and Elvira listening to a recorded Bible lesson with Les Veldick, a more patient and faithful couple I have yet to meet. I have lived and learned among God's faithful people, and I think this puts my mom back on the A-track. As for placing the Holy Scriptures in my hands, she did one better. She placed a hymnal in my hands, just as her mother did for her and her mother did for her. Music is where I found God. I joined my first choir at the age of three, and I have never looked back. That three-year-old has never stopped singing. Music has been how I've prayed, how I've communicated. It's how I've learned, and it's how I've taught. Music is why I chose the college I went to. I was not a music major, but I was not ready to stop singing just because I wanted to study writing. And I was not a music major, but I was able to join multiple choirs, and music was still an integrated piece of my life. Gustavus was the perfect blend of music, learning, and even a good little Lutheran faith thrown in for good measure. And I have had the honor to make music with incredibly talented people in incredibly beautiful places. I have sung my, at the top of my lungs at the top of a mountain to greet a sunrise. And I have sung when I couldn't form words through grief. Singing is how I learned Bible stories. It's even how I memorize Latin translations. My favorite memories of my great-grandmother are standing in her tiny kitchen, singing and dancing to the hymns that came over the radio. And my favorite memories with my Nana are driving in the truck, listening and singing to Anne Marie. And the one night a week I know I get to spend with my mom is Wednesday nights after choir practice. Music has been a consistent thread in everything that I do. Funny anecdote, in high school, one Saturday morning while we were building a set, my mom had come to help, and our theater director came through and said, Musicals are not real life because no one walks around bursting out in random song all the time. My mom and I both looked at him and said, they don't? I think he was hanging out with the wrong people. So placing holy scriptures in my hand has always meant more to me than just holding a Bible. It's having the right language to unlock the meaning. And for me, that's always been music. I think my mom gets extra credit for that one. And the final promise. Nurture them in faith and prayer so that your child may grow to learn to trust God. Proclaim Christ through word and deed. Care for others and the world God made. And work for justice and peace. It is because of fulfilled promises that I have felt nurtured in my faith. Being a part of this community is knowing that I am prayed for. St. Luke's has given me countless opportunities to proclaim Christ through word and deed care for others and God's world, and to work for peace and justice. But what's more, it's given me the confidence to do these things on my own. I have become involved in organizations that raise awareness and fund research aimed to help those living with diabetes and Alzheimer's. I use my finances to support organizations that strive to conserve and restore God's world. And I use my voice to join with other voices to advocate for justice and peace. I am faithful because I have lived among God's faithful people. 
The verse I chose for my confirmation was the first reading from this morning. And paraphrasing it, it was really just 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for you to prosper and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And as a 14-year-old, this peace brought me great comfort, knowing that there was a God who had a plan for me. While it's very reassuring to a 14-year-old who has their whole lives in front of them, I knew I could trust in the promise of that path ahead and that it would be filled with prosperity and hope if I just believed. As my faith journey has progressed, I have come to understand the history behind this passage. I still choose Jeremiah 11, but I also include 10 and then all the way through 14. Again, paraphrasing. Then you will call on me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you. It was actually in our Wednesday night Bible study when we were doing Ezekiel about two years ago that I fully comprehended the meaning of those verses. See, Jerusalem had been conquered and the Israelites had been scattered. Their kingdom had already been divided, but now their temple lay in ruins. Some of them felt abandoned and some felt betrayed, but they all felt hopeless. But God promises them tomorrow. He promises he will always be with them when they seek him, and he promises that he will bring them back together again. If God can do that for a whole nation of people, I can only imagine what he can do for me. As my faith has matured, I realize that God doesn't promise that this way won't be difficult. But God does promise that there is a better future, and he will not abandon us when we call on him in difficult times. And just because I have lived a faith-filled life does not mean that I have been immune to heartache, stress, and grief. It means that I have faith enough to trust in the God who has a plan for me and will be found when I seek him. It means that I have been nurtured enough knowing that I have a community of faithful people to lean on when I need help. My faith journey has been one of baptismal promises. It may not have bells and whistles, but it's deeply fulfilling. At my baptism, St. Luke's congregation promised to be a part of my faith journey. And whether I have known you a lifetime, a short time, or have yet to have the pleasure to meet you, by being here, you are a part of that promise now too. So thank you. It takes a village to raise a child, and I am eternally grateful that you are my village. Amen. And in the theme of promises, I invite you to stand and join Jubilee as we sing one of my favorite songs, Promises, written by Greg Anderson. Take 
now with the Lord, and he will surely give you all of the desires of your heart. He'll command his angels now, and they will lift you up. He'll keep you safe if you will just believe. profess our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With reverence for the earth, those in need, and the whole human family, let us offer our prayers to God. For the church, for leaders to proclaim your grace and prophets to call us to your justice and truth, Lord, in your mercy. For judges and magistrates, political and civic leaders, firefighters and police officers, arbitrators and mediators, farmers and laborers, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the earth, that the land will yield its increase and all creation flourish with your prosperity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who work for cures for cancer and other diseases, and for all who work to prevent and treat malaria, for all living with suffering, sickness, or despair, for ministries of compassion and care in your community, Lord, in your mercy, for the members of this assembly who give generously of their time, abilities, and gifts, for the grace to see your presence in the loved ones and strangers we will meet this day. Lord, in your mercy, we give thanks for all the faithful who were marked with the seal of the Spirit. May we too receive the pledge of our inheritance to the praise of your glory. Lord, in your mercy, our receive our hopes and prayers, O God of mercy, for great is your faithfulness in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now let's pray together using the words our Father taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And now during this time of reflection and response, Please take a moment to fill out your welcome card with any prayer requests and use this time to prepare your offering. Hi. 
Please stand for the benediction. People of God, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now please join us in our ascending song, Holy is the Lord. We bow down. 
peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.